Hello, and welcome to Armenian Enough, a podcast about life and identity in the diaspora, with your host, Lara Vanian Green. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Armenian Enough. I'd like to start first by thanking our monthly Patreon donors of $5 or more. We do record in advance, so if for whatever reason I don't mention your name today, listen for it next time. I would like to thank Andrea Noravian, Alyssa Zakarian, Elizabeth Bowles, Zari Yasayan, Talar Kaosian, Monica Davidanian, Elisa Aslanian Zamora, Anna Darian, Narine Hakopian, Marguerite Sagatelian, Lori Yatarian, Natalie Arshakian, Justin Moradian, Ara Babayan, Ara Kasparian, Emma Shanavian, and Aaron Carr. Thank you so much for being patrons of this show. It means the world to me. Today's guest has many different talents and interests, but I first heard about Paul when I read the headlines that a former Big Brother contestant changed pronouns from him to they. And as soon as I saw the last name Abrahamian, I knew I wanted to have them on our podcast. Paul is, among other things, a fashion designer, an actor, a musician, and someone who collects human skulls. We will definitely talk about that one later. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Paul Abrahamian. Hello, 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 hello. What's up? Thank you for having me. Thank you. First off, I love just the name of your podcast is so cool. I, I've done I've done a lot of weird interviews and I've done all these over the years, you know, I've had to do a bunch of random stuff, but this one particularly piqued my interest because your name is so awesome, you know, Armenian enough. And that has been like kind of like a recurring theme idea for me, especially with all that's been going on with our culture as of late. So super cool of you to like everything that you're doing, I'm I am personally a fan of. So I'm very uh-huh. excited to be getting the chance to talk to you. That's very sweet. And and I also, I'd like to hear more about how the name appeals to you because, you know, different people have different reactions to Armenian enough. Some people are like, oh, that's interesting. Isn't it a little limiting? And other people are like, oh my no, God, empo- I get it. I'm empowered it. by it. I'm empowered <laughs> by it. I love it because that's how I felt on the inside my whole life, you know, being weird or different. It's a really deep, it goes back far, but aside from you know, me just giving you the schlep of my history, it really resonates with me because I've always, even in my youth felt that like, yo, like, am I not Armenian enough for you? Am I like, what is it that you are rejecting me and the things I do? Like, how am I not Armenian? You know, what is Armenian enough? Those questions have always like ruminated in my head and thoughts growing up, particularly like going to an Armenian school when I was young. And you did? Yeah, I went to AGBU. That's where my daughter goes. <laughs> That's awesome. I went from the age of pre-K to like, I got out in ninth grade and went to like a real high school, like a <laughs> like a public school where uh-huh. I got to like assimilate with other cultures and other people, which was honestly the best thing that I, that happened to me in my opinion. Um, but I do have a sister that was there for her whole life from PK to 12th grade. And um, yeah, I just... Growing up in an Armenian school and being the way that I am, I have been the way that I am ever since I, I existed. Um, I think anybody, any of my like childhood friends maybe who are listening or anybody that has known me from my youth could probably attest to that. So we'll talk a lot about how you are, how you are, <laughs> but tell yeah. me a little bit about, so like, were you born in the United States and were, were your parents like first generation, second generation? So I was born in uh, Hollywood, California which is super cool in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Me too, uh, me too. Bo- yeah, born in the 818, very happy about it. My mother came from Yerevan when she was like a teenager. She went to Hollywood High School. She honestly turned out a little bit lamer than I would have hoped if, about like her going to Hollywood High School in the time that she came. I was like, dude, you couldn't have been a little cooler, dude. You went to like the coolest, coolest high school on this planet. Come on, mom, you know what I mean? And then my dad actually emigrated from Lebanon. He escaped war when he was a young, young lad, 16, 17. He left Lebanon, went to Canada, funny enough, lived most of his life in Canada, his adult life, and then met my mom via some Haikakan like thing. You know what I mean? And he fell in love with her and he's like, all right, like. Like online? 
They met through like no. an online dating site? No, no, no. I don't know that online was a thing back then. I think that it was just like an Armenian event that they would do. I don't know if it was in like Fresno, California or like somewhere in California. Okay. Um, and yeah, he like had traveled to California with his brother and then he met my mom and I guess they hit it off and he moved from Canada to America. Yeah. And they like established their old, their little life and started going with my sister. And then I popped out. I was born in 1993, born in Hollywood, California. I am first generation American. So you grew up with a lot of Armenian in your life is what I'm hearing. Oh, so much. I was entirely engulfed, encompassed by it. And it's really interesting because my mom's side of the family is like super like Yerevansi. There's definitely some questionable characters in that side of my family that are just like <laughs> total like, like you're, you're absolute. What is the word I'm looking for? Like you're um, the stereotypical like Yerevansi Armenians. Like I for sure have a cousin with like a Louis Vuitton interior vehicle, like Mercedes <laughs> Benz. And I don't feel good about that, but I also love how Armenian that is. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. So I have that on my mom's side. And then on my dad's side, they're like uh, Beiruti, more so Beiruti from like Musaler, Lebanon. So I was actually blessed with being able to speak two dialects. I could switch it up on you. I could turn like Gor Gor Yegur Guzem. You know what I mean? And then I could go straight like just like Rabi's Hayastansi just for the one time, you know? So uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, most people can't speak it both ways. I understand both dialects, but I couldn't like switch maybe for a sentence or two, but I couldn't keep it up for long. Dude, and it's my superpower too, because it's like, yo, I paint my nails, I look like a freak, but like Yo, I could read, speak, and write our mother tongue, baby. So is that not is that not Armenian enough for you? You know what I mean? Like, we're out here. I could write it. I could read it. I could speak it. I could give you two dialects. Like, what more do you want? I could give you our history. So, <laughs> so your family sounds like you. It sounds like you grew up in a fairly traditional family. Was there a, an aunt or an uncle who was a major rebel, or one of your parents was like low key rebellious? Like, who did you get it from? I don't know, dude. I mean, I have an uncle that was just kind of like a shithead. I don't know that he was rebellious, more so like an <laughs> asshole. But um, I don't know, like my dad was my dad was kind of a rebel when he was growing up. He was kind of just like he was just like, uh, I don't know, his own man. Like he was like the second to youngest in his family of seven. And he just had to like hustle and do his own thing his whole life, kind of independent. So I guess like that independence comes from my father. But I'd say my parents are cooler than most Armenian parents. I've definitely seen some Armenian parents that I don't know if I would last a day being under their roof, but they're definitely very traditional. And mm -hmm. it's taken uh, my entire lifetime to essentially get them to be as cool and accepting and <laughs> with the with the shits as they come off as you know what I mean I definitely take all of that credit if I can you know you just reminded me of when I used to tell my mom I like the way I've raised you I'm proud of who you straight become. up straight up I could not say that more I, I like the way that I raised you and that'll that'll branch off into another conversation I want to touch base on on Armenian parents and kids who feel maybe conflicted and yeah. how they can teach their parents how they can realize and identify that their parents are stuck in a mindset, you know, that they believe is true, or they don't, they didn't have resources or the knowledge or, or the freedom to express certain things to like, get past certain thought processes. And it is it is our responsibility as children who maybe see that and identify that to help change that and teach them from a place of love and not from a place of judgment and anger that maybe they would have done or come from, you know? I really love that. I really, yeah. really love that because it's actually coming from a place of love and compassion and strength in who you are. I, I can't yeah. tell you like how many Armenians in particular I see, especially, you know, I guess more women were going to contact me and say like, oh, I'm in love with this man, but he's not Armenian. Like, what can I do? And I, and I just tell them, do you still live with your parents? Because step one is no. start squirreling away some money and get gain your own independence so that you can make your own rules. And then you can set your boundaries and then you can communicate those boundaries and you can tell them why you set these boundaries. And, you know, Armenian parents... They're smart. Our people are smart. They understand. They're compassionate. So it's all a matter of just explaining it to them in their language, right? In a language that they understand as opposed to just being upset or frustrated. And I learned that, you know, in my teen years, it was just butting heads, dude. I was an absolute rebel. I was an absolute little teenage shithead. 
coming home from like late from like punk shows, screaming, moshing, screaming upstairs. My poor parents are like, oh, our child is possessed by the devil. We don't know what to do. Uh, my sister, of course, was a doctor, right? The golden child. She became a yes. doctor. And they were ready to have a doctor and a lawyer. And then I just smashed that birthday cake right on the floor for that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm relating a little too well to this. I used to be, well, before I got into punk rock, I was into heavy metal. Like we're yes. talking the, the late eighties yes. and, um, and my mom would just like, I'd be getting ready and I'd have whatever music on on my little cassette player. Cause that's what we used in the olden days. That's and awesome. my, my mom would walk by and she'd be like, turn off that satanic music. And oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. I've been there. Trust me. I've been there. <laughs> oh, so how did you how did the rebellion start like how did you start expressing Damn, your are individuality you, are you are you ready for this conversation like yes this this uh, this story goes way back so ever since i was a kid i was always a little different i was always a little bit more rambunctious um it started with like a pretty big trauma in my family my my mom's sister was like murdered oh, i was I'm young sorry. yeah like it's honestly a typical like abusive Armenian toxic masculine situation that was going on. And from a young age, I saw this like affect my family. I saw it affect my mom, my daughter, my poppy, my cousins. I saw it all unravel. And I was born and raised in a Christian household. I went to a Christian school, but like I always thought about things, you know, I was always very introspective growing up. I was always like in my head. It was always like very like, like, I don't know. I would think, in the lines and realms of like philosophy and then furthering thought and thinking about just things, questioning things that I was told. Mm -hmm. And I saw how these things affected my family. And I started questioning religion. I started questioning Christianity and the things that I was being told in Armenian school and the Armenian school did not like that. And they, they, uh, they said that <laughs> I was starting to create like some sort of rebellion just because I would ask and poise certain questions in religion class that they didn't like. And I had long hair, always had long hair, like especially in my youth. Um, so I'd grow my hair out long. I was into rock and roll. I would sometimes paint my nails and they just hated it. Like the Armenian school hated it. They hated me for no reason. I right. didn't misbehave. I didn't get in trouble. I would get seemingly good grades. They just didn't like that I was different. And they couldn't pick on me for anything else other than me being different. They just wouldn't let me be. You understand what I'm saying? They always like picked an issue with me or would talk to my mom or they would cross boundaries and disrespect me or speak to me in ways that like are not okay for a teacher to say to me but because they like blur those lines of like you know sometimes these Armenian schools like these teachers speak to you as if like they're your mom or they're your mom's friend or yes. because we're so like tr communal and tribal they feel like they can parent you or something and that mm -hmm. never that never sat well with me as a kid, especially a rebellious one, being like, yo, you are not my mom and you absolutely cannot say that shit to me. So <laughs> this is not okay. Like I've been told to like choke this, that, like as like a young 12 year old. Like, what do you mean? Like, I was in like an Armenian history class or something once and I started coughing uh -huh. and the teacher just like wasn't having it or like hated me. I don't know what. And she's like, and I, I said, Nero Vuchun, you know, I was like, sorry, like I was fucking choking on something. And they're like, <laughs> they said some what? shit like that to me, bro. <laughs> and like 12 year old me was so shook. I was like, what? Did this lady really say that shit to me? Like, what the fuck? If you could <laughs> see my face right now, my jaw is yeah, yeah, on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I would bring these stuff up. And then like finally, I like went to the office with my mom and I was like, yo, this is bullshit. The way y'all are talking to me is bullshit. And I, I started posing these questions in religion class. I'm like, yo, but like, if God really loves all of us, like, why why did the, why did 1.5 million of our homies get killed like what, what are you talking about like why would god do that to us bro like we're the first christians i'm taking religion class how it's bought me you know i'm learning all these things and they're telling me how much god loves me and i'm like wait 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 but like why did this happen then you know what i mean and these kinds of questions were they didn't like it they didn't like that i was asking the right questions so i yeah. left armenian school and that's pretty much like where the rebellion age started was questioning authority, but like for good reason and questioning religion for good reason. And yeah. And then my parents were always pretty open to hear me, but I definitely hit them with some like speed balls that were, you know, out of the norm, the rock and roll, the screaming, 
they just immediately thought I was going to become a drug addict or like a Satan worshiper or all the bad things they could think of. They're like, our kid is like going off, them, you know? Paul, the audio is breaking up a little bit. Oh, um, wait, can you hear me now? I mean, I can hear you, but it just sounds like a little like scratchy or I don't know what you're talking on or if you're just using the computer speakers or if, if you have any other. I'm on my, I'm on my AirPods. Okay. Oh, that might be it. I might have been too far from my computer. How about now? Is this fine? It sounds okay now. Okay, cool. I'll just stay in like the vicinity. Stay in one place, Paul. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, sorry. I'm pacing. <laughs> um, no, you know what? Actually, we had a, a, a little bit of a similar upbringing in that in the sense that I switched back and forth from Armenian private school to public school, and it was such a completely different world. Oh, yeah. um, the, the private schools feel, felt so sheltered. And the public school felt like I was exposed to everything, you know, for better or right. worse. Right, right, right. Totally. You mentioned something about when you talked about your aunt's passing that mm. it was connected to some form of toxic masculinity. So I, you know, with all due respect, I don't want to go into details that you don't want to talk about. But no, of course. But from that, you know, did that kind of start to affect your views on gender and who you wanted to be? I don't think that that was what changed my viewpoints on gender, more so being told that my whole life, petka martliness, or you got to do this, martavari petkaliness, or this or that. Like, I started to realize that gender, equating, equating like who you are as a person or your accomplishments with like gender identity is absolutely stupid. And I don't think, I don't want to be respected or admired or revered for being a man. I want all those things for who I am and what I create and what I do and how I present myself in this world. I don't need to be identified just by gender or by, you know, my biological like genitalia. Like that's not important. And I feel like amongst Armenians, we have like this, we have these hard rigid lines surrounding gender identity and how certain genders need to conform. And I even see this weird toxicity amongst like the internet, amongst like new age Armenian men that like, speak about our Armenian women in the most closed-minded, asinine ways. And I cannot, I simply cannot wrap my mind around it. And I just think it's something that needs to be broken down a little bit because we are limiting ourselves and we are projecting like weird generational trauma and insecurity onto our people for no reason. We're limiting and we're putting them in a box. We're making them feel a certain way. And it is then turning into toxic masculinity. I know Armenian men that have identified as being gay, right? Probably since they were young, but they felt like they needed to put on a front and they got married to a woman and they had kids with a woman. And then midway through their life, they had like a mental breakdown and pretty much like abandoned their family because they finally like, they came to terms with being gay, right? Yeah. And that blows my mind that somebody has to go through such mental turmoil because of a society and culture that claims to like love one another and needs to stick together, but imposes such like a societal pressure that they feel the need to go that route. And it, it genuinely makes me sad. One of the highest levels of social need, right? The hierarchy is a sense of belonging and figuring out your place in the world. And I think that our, the Armenian community needs a lot more voices like yours to talk about that because another part of sexism is that a lot of men will not give women's voices, opinions, thoughts, the same level of credence or attention that they would give a man. So this is really, really important for people to hear from an Armenian man. Yeah. And it's, it's disturbing to me that we need to hold such importance to gender, which it's such a in my opinion, silly construct, which is why I identify as they, them, because I don't want to be, I don't really care how somebody gender identifies me. I don't care what you think. I, you want to call me a she, they, whatever, you know, it's more so I want to encompass the idea that we don't need to be bound by gender norms or be defined by our birth given genders or whatever construct or belief system that is instilled and like forced upon the youth to perform in this way that, you know, that, that a man needs to perform or like, what? Like, I, and I don't even identify with certain of those things. Like I don't like shooting guns. I don't like doing these typical things that an Armenian man would necessarily like to do. But th does that make me less of an Armenian man? Does that make me less Armenian? Like 
all of these things started to not make much sense to me. And just being grown up here, or you have to do this because of this gender identity thing. But it's like, well, what if I don't resonate with that? Does that make me less of that gender just because I don't necessarily like doing that? All of these things were so confusing to me growing up and being like, what, what does that have to do with who I am as a person or what I like to do or what I don't like to do? Why are you associating that with my birth gender and just putting all this pressure on me, both culturally and societally that like, what if I don't resonate with that? What if I just don't F with that? Like, why do I have to fall into this social construct that you've created that I disagree with? I don't know. It's just, I've been thinking these things since I was a kid and I've seen it destroy people that I care about. You know, I've seen friends grow up and be unhappy because they never committed to certain things in their life or they were so bound by societal ideas or even toxic Armenian ideas, which we absolutely need to destroy because what we're going through now as a people, like we need to be enlightened, we need to be empowered and we need to be together. We need to unify. And what breaks my heart is that after a genocide and after another like ethnic cleanse that we recently went through, Armenians are still not unified. Armenians are still butting heads over arbitrary, stupid shit when it's yeah. like, dude, can y'all not just zoom out and see the bigger picture? Can y'all not just accept me? What I used to do for fun is go on like these Facebook Armenian forums and just troll these old Armenian, like toxic mentality, like old men that say that are absolutely like anti LGBTQ, anti acceptance yes. of Armenians that are even just slightly different than what they they think an armenian should be like and i would call them all turks like you guys are literally all like have like turkish mentality by denying any armenian their armenianhood because you don't agree with something that they choose to do with their life yes we have gatekeepers yeah it's disgusting i'm like dude you are no better than talat pasha you are if anything worse because you claim to be armenian and you're hating on your own armenians I'd rather someone be a clear cut enemy than someone claiming to be on my side and still like hurting me and stabbing me from the back. And that's what Armenians, unfortunately, have done to one another. And I think we're breaking out of that. This past war, I came back from Brooklyn because I wanted to be a part of the protests and the rallying. You know, my strong point is my speaking. I've been in the public eye, I've been in front of a camera. I know how to speak, I know how to assimilate with American culture because I've spent a lot of time learning about that, right? So I knew I had to pull up and and use my voice and and use my platform and use just like whatever it is that I could do to speak on behalf of the Armenians. And the things that I saw were pretty sad. The things that I had to deal with, you know, I pulled up and trying to get like myself to this megaphone. And here I am with like colored nails covered in tattoos, wearing an earring, all these rings. And these old army men are just looking at me like, what the, f- what? what on earth? <laughs> what is this? Who is this creature? But then I hit him with the bar of Akbar as well. They were shook. They didn't know what to do, dude. I'm kind of surprised you didn't bring your own megaphone, but okay. Oh, I did. I did. I oh. did. After the first two days of having to combat these dudes to tell them, yo, bro, I could speak English. You don't even speak English, okay? Let's start there. What are you even saying to people? We get it. Like all the Armenians that are here know what's happening. Why are you speaking in Armenian? We need to be speaking. We're trying to get allies. We're trying to get people on our side. We're trying to get people to understand what is happening in Armenia so they can be allies with us. What do you think they understand if you're going to be speaking in Armenian? Like Armenians already know. One hundred percent. There's no Armenian in the crowd that's listening to you, going, "Damn, I never. Damn, that's really happening." (laughs) Like we all know this, so I'm like, please let me speak in English at least, so the 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 word can get out. But I will say that experience, like, it was really awesome because these dudes, and I even had my own prejudice. I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna have to deal with these like Kiart Rabi's dudes. They're gonna give me a headache. Blah blah blah. This and that. You know, I had my own like stereotypical ideas going in that were broken by how awesome Armenians are in general. Because by the end of it, these Kyartu Rabis, whatever you want to say, were, were boys with me, dude. They were hugging me. They were embracing me. They were loving me. They didn't care. They got it. They got the message that I was trying to spread. So yes, maybe I was met with a little bit of like pushback, but I realized it's the way you communicate. It's the way you share your message to get them to understand. You can't meet them with 
anger or hate, you know, everything has to be spoken with love and understanding. And Armenians are smart people and they will understand. We just need to show them in a different way. And I don't think there are many Armenians, unfortunately, out there to show them because the ones who get out, right, who break out, who are artists, who are whatever, who are different, and they find a place for themselves, I often find that they reject their Armenianhood because they were suppressed by it. Yeah. Because they felt neglected be- because they felt like an outsider. So they they develop this weird animosity or resentment to their culture. And that's what makes me heartbroken. Because that, you know what you're just saying, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but like what you're just saying is exactly what I went through. Um, for a bunch of reasons, I didn't feel accepted in the Armenian community, even though I'm like 99.9% Armenian. But I, I just felt like I don't understand the rules. I'm always making some kind of mistake. I'm always being judged in all these ways and not quite measuring up. And I hated that feeling. And then when yeah. I actually, like when I was a teenager and I came out, you know, I was, I knew there would be no place for me in the Armenian society. And I was like, well, the heck with you people. Thanks, but no thanks. And I went on and I lived my life. And it wasn't, you know, I mean, my mom was a writer. I would always go to April 24th things, but that was the extent of my involvement. And right. It and wasn't- hearing, hearing that makes me so sad. Like to heck with you people, right? Because you felt so not belonging in this in this culture. And it's like, I yes. want to save as many Armenian souls like that as I can. I want to, I want them to know that they are accepted, that they are okay, and that I will fight that fight for as long as I'm alive. I will be weirder than them. And I, <laughs> trust me, I will. I will be the weirdest Armenian that you know. And that's a fact. And that's a promise because I want to be that catalyst. I want to be that scapegoat. I want to be the one that they can right. put their fingers to, to allow these other Armenians to feel comfortable, to allow these other fe- Armenians to feel like, you know what, there's someone else out there that's crazier. So I think I'm going to be okay. I mean, that's what this podcast is about, to highlight so many different kinds of Armenians, because we are everything, everything you can think of. There's an Armenian who's done it or is doing it or is right about to do it right now. Like, we exist everywhere. And I and I really just reject this whole notion of gatekeepers to the culture, which is why the podcast is called Armenian Enough. I mean, I really, I, and I coined the term sort of Armenian adjacent, you know, there's like my husband is, has not got a drop of Armenian in him. Okay. But he loves Armenian culture. He, right. he studies it. He studies the language. He studies the history. He is so into raising our daughter with as much Armenian as possible. I mean, he wanted to give her an Armenian awesome. name. And I was like, awesome. no, you know, your parents need to be able to pronounce it. <laughs> and, and honestly, like what's not to love. We are, we are like, I, I don't I don't know that I would say that I'm a nationalist, but I am such an Armenian stan. Like I I am definitely like I will probably say like I think Armenians are the best people out there. And like <laughs> and even even though I've been through what I've been through, even though I've been rejected my whole life and had to find my own identity and empower myself, I still feel that way. I think Armenians are magical people. I dead ass believe that. And it's it didn't take me leaving LA and meeting Armenians all over the world to realize how special it really is to be Armenian. And again, I was bullied. I was neglected, even within my own family, dude. Like I had cousins, uncles that like, they just didn't mess with me. They always had something to say. They always looked at me a certain way. They always thought I was weird. They always, you know what I mean? Like even imagine feeling that way. And I'm sure you know, is like even within your own family, like not forget like the tribe of being Armenian. Forget like your cultural pressure and your own family pressure, just not really like vibing with you. That sucks. And I've and, and I even had to deal with that growing up. And where does your strength come from? Um, you know, I think to be honest and not even to sound corny, I think my strength comes from my ancestors. Mm. My both of my great grandparents fought. Like one of them fought in the forty nights of Musaled. And the, another one fought in like in the mountains of Yerevan in Armenia, like fought Turks. Their family members died. They were the survivors. They escaped. They lost friends, family. They made it. They were fighting. They were shooting guns. They survived. And there is like this, I'm born with both of those energies, both of those survivalist energies. Both of my great grandparents were fighters, not only survivors, but fighters. And I honestly think that my my spirit and my energy is tapped in further than things that can just weigh me down. I come from 
I am a bloodline descendant of survivors. So it's, it's almost like embedded in my coding to survive past any adversity. And like, how silly would it be for me not to, not to overcome these things? I live a privileged life here in America. I'm so privileged in comparison to like what my, my great grandparents or my ancestors had to go through to even survive. And I'm over here getting tripped up about acceptance or not doing this. It's like, no, I can find that love and acceptance within me because I'm stronger than that. I've made it this far in my lineage and blood to do something greater than to just lose, you know, than to just cave in, than to just give up, than to just feel sad. And unfortunately, I have had family, like I lost a cousin to these pressures and he was half Jewish, half Armenian. Mm -hmm. His mother was Polish. His father is a brother of my father. And he took his own life um, almost like a decade ago now. And that's when we found out that he was gay. Oh. Like I never knew my cousin was gay. I never knew. And he never told anyone. And the reason he never told anyone was because of those same pressures that are the exact problem that we're talking about. And it's like, I didn't know that my cousin was going through these struggles and turmoil. And had I known, you know, maybe I could have helped. Maybe he could still be here. Right. right. And I, I think a lot of this were eye openers for my parents too. And I'm like, at the end of it all, does it matter? Do you care? What if he was gay or not? Do you care if he liked this or didn't like this? Or do you just care that he was still here with you? And I think that was a big eye opener for both of my parents to kind of like realize that this arbitrary bullshit of like whether someone is gay, straight, likes this, likes that, paints their nails, doesn't paint their nails, identifies this way, doesn't like none of that matters, dude. Like it, it's not about you in the in that those situations. It's not about how you feel in those situations. It's about the person who's doing it, how they feel. And how they want to feel, you know? Right. Our ancestors didn't go through everything they went through so that we could be boxed in some little what it means to be Armenian box. You know, they. I believe that they went through what they went through, that fighting for life, that survival so that we could thrive and be who we authentically are. Because that is that is the real gift to the Armenian culture yep. and community and people is us being who we are. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And And again... I don't want to sound like a nationalist or 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 crazy, but I truly think Armenians are the best people ever. Like I think we are gifted. I think we're special. I think we're magical. I'm going to plead the fifth on that. I love <laughs> us, but I'm going to plead the fifth on we're the best people ever. <laughs> I, I know, I know, it's a little crazy, but I I am truly tapped into this like Armenian hood. I am so proud to be Armenian. I am so proud to identify as Armenian, and I think that there are a couple quirks that were set up due to trauma, due to experience, due to getting sold by the evils of this world that have tainted the the, the magic, that have tainted, disillusioned mm -hmm. the true power of Armenians. But like, we're an ancient people. We are an ancient, tribal, earthly, magical people. And I think it's my duty to like tap back into that and share that power and the power of unity that we have. Again, I didn't realize how awesome it was to be Armenian until I got out of LA, until I left the Armenians here, the, the the toxic bubble that I was in between the school or this or that, or just like the toxicity that was created amongst being an LA Armenian and traveling to Prague, traveling to Budapest, traveling to Switzerland and seeing, meeting Armenians and being immediately treated like I was their family, like yes. they've known me their whole life. And that is magical. I, I think there's like a William Saroyan poem yeah. or something where it's like, if you meet an Armenian anywhere in the world, I don't know, they tell me that they will not start dance and create a new Armenia. Yeah. And I really, I really, 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 really think that that's true. Just based on my own experiences, just based on meeting Armenians all over the place and being immediately accepted on no other basis other than, oh, you're Armenian. That's awesome. I love being Armenian outside of LA. Like that is actually really fun. <laughs> right, right, right. And it's like that connection that I've experienced that like, oh, you're Armenian sick. That's it. That's all we needed. Uh, they didn't care what I did. They didn't care where I've been. They didn't care who I was. They just cared that I was also Armenian and I was treated with an immediate bond, an immediate understanding, an immediate relatability, an immediate comfort that I don't know that many other cultures, maybe, maybe they can, maybe I'm just a little delusional, but I, I truly think that there's something special there and it hurts me to deal with, to, to like have experienced those things. And then to see Armenians just hating uh, Armenians, like 
Armenian on Armenian hate, judgment, passiveness. Whenever I see that, like it really hurt, like breaks my heart. It really grinds my gears because we have been through so much as a culture, as a people. And to sit here and turn inwards and fight inwards really just makes zero sense to me. Like it's like there's no logical sense as to why we do that. I think people don't really know the kind of damage that it causes, like what happened to your cousin. They don't make those connections. And this is why like, it's so important to be inclusive and welcome people into the fold. You know, I've said this probably too many times on the show, but just like there's a way to become Jewish if you want to marry a Jewish person, person, I wish there was a way to like become Armenian. Like you study for this many months and you pass this test and then you're like an honorary Armenian because we need more people in our folds. Yeah, I I, <laughs> fe- I hear what you're saying, but I... I... <laughs> I almost feel like we need to heal inwards first and get our own Armenians to be Armenian. No, that's feel me? true. Because there's yeah. a lot of Armenians that are an Armenian. Like they really aren't. And there's yeah. nothing that they identify with that makes me go, damn, you're Armenian. Other than the tropes that, okay, you, you like this. Okay. You listen to this music. You eat Khorovats. Okay. You drive a Mercedes. Sure, 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 sure. Like, yeah, you could fall into the tropes of being Armenian, but like inward, spiritually, energy, soul wise, there's a lot of Armenians that aren't Armenian and they project those insecurities on Armenians that are Armenian and they try to deny them or they try to put them in a box or try to push them out and stuff like that, like literally makes my blood boil. And I have dedicated, I have re, not recently dedicated, but in my, as I grew up in my twenties, dedicated myself, my art, who I am to be this voice for the unheard Armenians who don't feel like they belong who don't feel like they can assimilate to this culture, I want them to feel that they're going to be okay because I didn't really have that growing up. I had System of a Down, sure. Um, that was my closest tie-in, you know, and they did so much for me growing up as I'm sure they did many Armenians. But I worry about these follow-up generations that don't really have a crazy Armenian or someone that is like outspoken or different or, or strange and, and thriving in it to look up to or to feel comfortable by or to made feel like they're not crazy they're not weird you know because that's what system of a down did for me they made me feel like hey i'm not weird i'll be okay look these guys are armenians look how weird they are i'm that's all right incredible so i it's it's almost become like my duty and mission and like i don't know what to like be that for the younger generations because i don't want an armenian soul to ever not feel like they belong in our community because our community is so beautiful and so pure but it has been tainted by the traumas that we've been through and unfortunately it has poisoned some of our communities into being the way that they are today and i i don't think that i'm going to be the change and i don't think one person could be the change but i want to at least contribute and help somehow I really feel like there's a a life purpose or a partial life purpose. I don't think we only have one brewing in that. And I can't wait to see like what you do with that energy because you've done a million things and it looks like you, I mean, if I had to like psychoanalyze you from afar, you like really, really get into one thing and then you're like, okay, maybe done with that. And then you really, really get into the next thing. And I can only say that because that's how I am with my life. But, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) fashion designer, musician, actor, Fill in the bored. blank. I get. I, I don't. I don't bind myself by limits in life. I don't believe that you should just be one thing. Like I want to do a bunch of things. What do you want to do? do? One thing. No, no. Like I'm just speaking in in general. Like I don't want to be bound by one thing. Just the same way I don't want to be bound by my gender identity. Like I don't want to be bound by anything. I want to do everything that I want to do, and I don't need to be labeled or called a certain thing or done a certain thing. I just want to do what I want to do and be who I want to be and not have to deal with any. Anybody else's, you know, weird energy about it or, or, or feelings about it. It's not about anybody else but myself. It's freedom. It's freedom. It's being free and true freedom. Not being bound by any of these ideologies or not being uh, dragged down by, you know, a lot of these things. Whenever I was speaking at the recent like protests and art talks stuff in LA, there were so many Armenians that were just like not stoked. You know what I mean? They were like, who is this guy with his painted nails? Is this who we need to like be representing Armenian people? But then like I I made some allies that were like really on some like Ravi's dudes, but allies that saw me that were there that like 
that I got to change their perception and then be like, like I heard, I heard this one Robbie's dude straight turn to his friend and stand up for me like that. That's the beginning of something really important. It really is. And, and it was that grassroots getting to meet these people, getting to talk to these people. And like, I'm very open. Like I smoke weed. I'm, I'm a hippie. I'm open. I don't care. And I was like smoking weed at some of these protests just because I'd be standing there pouring my heart out into the microphone, getting emotional, getting crazy, getting tired, not sleeping, constantly speaking. You know, we were putting in active work, me and my group of friends. So we would need, uh, you know, a little marijuana breaks every now and again. <laughs> and, and then one of my friends were like, dude, be careful. Like, I'm like, what do you mean? Be careful. Like, what is anyone going to do or say to me? I don't care. Like, and it's what? legal. Yeah. And it's, it's, I'm like, dude, what? You need to stop caring. And one of these Armenian dudes that were, you know, that I had like warmed up to and they were cool, but they were still very traditional Armenian, uh, like slowly approached me and he's like, and I, in my head, I'm like, all right, here we go. Here we go. You know? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, up it. I'm like, yeah. He's like, Unes mi kich <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, wait, huh? I'm like, each, I'm like, I'm like, bro, I'm in a here, bro. I'm like, what do you want? So, you want me to mix some tobacco in there? It was my spleef she named kiss. Warnes was a mafer. Armenian hospitality with marijuana. I love I, it. Like, I rolled this dude like <laughs> three fatties and he was so happy and he was so like secretive. He was like, okay, okay. He's like, okay, Kalinem, I'm like, yeah, bro. <laughs> like, you'll be totally fine. And it was just, I had such a wholesome experience with that whole with the art talk situation i know it works right it worked on like a grassroots level of like i took these very impassioned empowered armenians that were hurt and upset about what's going on at home and i i matched that it's like look dude i'm feeling what you're feeling i am equally if not more upset you hear the words i'm saying you hear how i feel and they're seeing this but they're also seeing my image and yeah. like in their in their head, it's like system error, system error. Like, <laughs> don't get it. How is this yeah. dude speaking high astansi like and, and speaking these things that are on my mind, but he's not, he doesn't look like me. He doesn't act like me. And it broke those barriers down. As time progressed, as I spent days, days in and out with them, they slowly started to change. They slowly started showing their appreciation towards me. I would walk in. Dude, my mom, it was so funny. I'm like, mom, you need to come with me to one of these. You will be blown away by the types of Armenians that are like coming up to me and embracing me. You would like not believe it, you know? And it was such a wholesome experience even for me just because of that, because it shows that not everyone is stuck in that way. And you just have to be patient and find a language to just get them to understand and to get them to change and to get them to grow and to be more accepting and heal. Because it's, I, I really think it's all about healing. We've been hurt. Yeah. We've been hurt as a culture. We've been hurt as a people generationally. So much we've been hurt. We hurt ourselves to the point. It's like weirdly, like we have like a self harm thing. As a, as a culture, we've developed a self harm because of the trauma that we've dealt with. You know what I mean? And yeah. I don't understand. I mean, I do understand it, but I don't understand why we can't snap out of it. I don't understand why we meet. Maybe certain people do things and we disagree with them. And instead of like speaking to them in a way that maybe they'd understand why, you know, what they're doing isn't necessarily correct. We just meet it with your typical high on like bashing, shaming or, or like, I just don't think that's the way that's not the way to speak to anyone. Well, do you think it's changing with the younger generation? Absolutely. Absolutely. This younger generation is so homo, bro. This younger <laughs> generation is so delicious. <laughs> I want to eat all of them up. You know what You're I mean? So they're funny. so good, dude. Like they're open-minded. They're this, they're that. They're smart as hell. They're so smart. Like Jebet Gadanen, bro. They're so smart. They know their history. They're empowered and they're not taking shit from anybody. And I, I want to empower them further. Like I want to I want to ignite or pour kerosene all over them and get them to prosper and be as empowered. That's as an interesting possible. metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I know that was probably not the best. You metaphor, want to set them on fire and set them free. I want to set them on fire in the best way. You know what I mean? In the way that, like, look, you're you're gonna be all right. Just follow your heart, follow your passions. You're accepted. You are Armenian enough. You're more than enough. Just you know, embrace it. 
And again, I hate to see Armenians who reject their Armenianhood because they have felt like they haven't fit in. And I have met tons of them over the years of existing as one of those weird Armenians. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. We're not going to allow that to continue. Yeah. And I like to think I am a weird anomaly because although I've been rejected by my community and sometimes by my own family my whole life, I can't get enough of being Armenian. When I went to Armenia, on a cellular level, something changed inside of me. I felt so connected to the land. I felt so, it was weird. And not unlike some hippy dippy bullshit, like I really felt overwhelmed with emotions. Like I don't cry. (laughs) I don't cry ever. Like, unless it's like a sad Matthew McConaughey movie, I'll cry. You feel (laughs) me? But like, I don't actually cry. And I couldn't stop crying. The wind would just hit me a certain way. And I'd just be like in front of like a Hinkali place or some shit, like not even anything spectacular. And I would just start crying, dude. I start crying. I'm like, like, this is so crazy, you know? It, there is something on a cellular level. Cellular level, I can really relate to that. I, I was 13 the first time that I went back to Armenia. Not back. The first time that I went to Armenia, and I really felt it. Like, oh my god, I'm standing on Armenian soil. This is yeah. this is my homeland that I've never been to, and it's such a strange. Feeling. We're indigenous people. We're natives. We are native. We are one of the first 12 tribes. We are the first peoples to exist in the world. We are ancient. And that is so special. And that energy is undeniable. And it's we're not about to like lose that. You understand what I'm saying? Like We're not about to lose that with inward hatred. That's not going to be the death of Armenians. Armenians can't be the death of themselves. And the more I can empower and enlighten and, and open up toxic learned behaviors that we just don't need, I think that's, you know, that's my goal. That's my mission. That's my journey. I don't know. I don't know how you want to paint it, but being Armenian, I don't know what I would do if I was an Armenian. Like it is so much of my identity and who I've become. I was ready to go fight in that Arsaf war. I was ready to die for that shit. Granted, my parents were really like really using these like manipulative tactics to not get me to go. But like, if it came down to it, if Armenia was in danger, I would absolutely feel comfortable dying in Armenia for Armenia. And not even, and I've, I don't even, I don't even have guns. I don't even fight. I don't care. But I just know intrinsically, like if it came down to it, I would not want to live in a world where Armenianness could not continue. And Armenianness means so much to me and my identity and who I am. And it has made me the loving person that I am, aside from all the toxic shit that isn't actually an attribute of Armenianness. It is more so just trauma that is being projected and displaced amongst our community. So it's not Armenianness. I don't know where I would be without that identity. And I don't want to live in a world where the future generations could not have that same experience and identity that I did. So that is mm. something that I'm willing to die for. That is something that I'm willing to be a poster child for. Whatever it takes for me to save that energy uh, maybe it's like intrinsically instilled upon me by my great grandfathers of like survival. I don't know what it is, but this is my way of doing that, of keeping Armenian survivalism. And if that is to like make us more loving and accepting of each other, then I'm happy to make that my life goal. That's deep. I That's know. Sorry. I told you I ramble. I'm crazy. No, but like, I no. am really passionate about being Armenian. And here's the thing. I, I don't want to stop you from talking about being Armenian and how you feel. But I would be really not doing my job if we didn't at some point talk yeah, about switch, the skull collecting. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> so uh, you collect actual human skulls. I feel which... like we might have to do like part one, part two, because I am crazy in my nature <laughs> and I can talk forever. So it's like you could be you're, you're invited back anytime. But if you've still got time now, I, I would love to because I was listening to a different podcast that you did. And you were talking about all the things that you were learning, like forensically from these skulls and all the really cool things that you could tell. But I'm just, you know, as a grandchild or great grandchild of Armenian genocide survivors, it, it is a little morbid to collect skulls. I mean, I get it because hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I live okay. in morbid. What? So let's let's start here. What makes it morbid? Why do you think that skulls are morbid? It's morbid because it is widely seen as a symbol of death. It's okay, a representation so why, of death. Why do you represent death with a negative connotation? I personally don't. 
Um, but it is a cultural thing that, you know, when you see whatever you, you deal with, like Halloween or you deal with in general, our Western society has a real aversion to death, right? You talk about why we even have living rooms in our houses. They used to be parlors and the parlor room was where you sat up the deceased for a week and had everyone come in and say, say their last yep. goodbyes. And they you still know, do that in a lot of places. Well, we don't do it here. And our death is very sanitized. You know, you don't, you don't, in the streets in India, you'll see dead people or, you know, all over the place. You don't do that here. We're very, it's, we're very sheltered. It's not a part of life. We even put our old people in old folks homes. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but there it's, we don't get to see this amazing circle of life. I don't feel like sounding like a Disney movie right now, but like, we don't get to watch the whole process, the beauty, the pain, the, the tragedy, the transcendence. You know, I was there when my mom passed away and I closed her eyes and I remember I knew she was gone because in one second from from when she was alive, she didn't look like herself. Yep. It was my mom laying in bed, and then it was a body that suddenly didn't look like my mom. And because I it wasn't, feel it her. wasn't your mom. It wasn't exactly. your mom anymore. It was just a shell of. It was a vessel that your mom once inhibited with the energy that made your mom. So yeah, it was a meat wanna, suit oh, for our it's for our souls. A meat suit. So if you want to open this. <laughs> open this up. We can open it up. But first and foremost, I think that the West has an absolute nasty viewpoint of death. Um, I'm going to start off by saying death is beautiful. Death is the one truth that we have in life. That is the one thing you're told in life is that you will die. That is the one given knowledgeable truth that we have to hang on to is that you will die. Yes. And, and we, <laughs> I don't know what it is, society, especially in the West, especially in capitalism. I'm going to go a little crazy on capitalism. Go for it. But death is used to as a fear tactic. What is really messed up is the one truth that we do have is used to manipulate us into functioning in the way that we do in our current Western society. Death is used as a weapon against us because it's so sanitized and removed that when death re-enters your life, you're shocked. Mm. You're not surrounded by it. You're shocked because you're so removed from the idea of death. We're so removed by our mortality that when somebody dies, it's this whole thing. Oh, how sad. Oh, how about... It's not sad. It's part of life. It is the only part of life that you know. I find life more scary than death because I wasn't born being told what's going to happen in my life. Lord knows I could face atrocity. My 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 ancestors were not told that. They were given life and they faced genocide. They they were that's scarier than death, in my opinion. That's scarier than dying, right? Facing that, seeing that torture, torment, seeing what our people went through is worse than dying, in my opinion. Absolutely. So life is scarier than death. But we have been fooled by society in order to control the way that we do things by being afraid of death. I study different cultures. I study different cultures that embrace death, that celebrate the ideas of death, or that at least view them in a different way. And there's less depression. There's less ideation of like detachment. There's less unhealthy psychological issues that come from death that we face here in America. When my grandpa died about two years ago, I nearly went into my mom's doctor's office and and went to prison for beating the shit out of my mom's doctor because he prescribed my mom like four or five different antidepressants to deal with her father's death. And it's Mm. not like my mom is, has like BPD or she's unhinged or she needs some extra, like she has like mental illness that she needs to have. Like it was just, she was dealing with the natural dealings of death in a society that doesn't prepare you for death. And the quick solution for my mom's doctor was to get her on like a cocktail of, mm. of antidepressants. We and are very was, averse to grief as a culture. We don't know how to handle grieving people. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. And we don't know how to hold the space for that emotion. Again, because death is used to control us with fear. We fear death. We fear the idea of dying. We do. We are so egocentric as human beings that we we will do anything not to die. You understand what I'm saying? We'll do yeah. anything to get a treatment. We'll do anything to look younger. They sell us on the anti of our mortality, but our mortality is what our natural code is. That's what makes life so beautiful. I preach that to people that if you didn't die, life would be so whack. Life would be so boring and not homov because you would have all the time in the world, right? But the fact that you don't have all the time in the world makes anything that you do homov. And we look at death in the wrong point of view. And my Another little calling of mine that I have, aside from just Armenian people, is to get people, to give people this this 
knowledge of death that has been stripped away from them. I live with 100 human skulls in my apartment in Brooklyn. I have 100 human heads. And I used to be so scared of death. I used to put myself as a 10, 11, 12-year-old in an existential crisis. I would put myself in a panic attack because I couldn't fathom the thought of not existing. And it wasn't even dying. It was being not conscious anymore. I studied philosophy. I was into like introspective thinking and existentialism ever since I was like 10 years old. It's really weird. Maybe even younger. I would always think these crazy abstract ideas. So I literally developed a panic disorder because I would put mm. myself in, in like mental loops of like, well, what happens when you die? Where does, where does this little narrator in my head go? Where wow. do I just stop experiencing? I don't believe in going to heaven or hell because that doesn't make much sense. And I'm like, well, so what happens if that's not real? And I wasn't really privy to other religions at the age of 11. I just thought Christianity or bust, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't really believe that. that. That seems a little weird to me. There's a lot of inconsistencies here. I, I was really, up until like my early 20s, was petrified of not existing. And again, it's not like I was afraid to die. I just didn't know. It, it was more so the after. The void. Like it, yeah, the void. What is that void? And I don't. I'm chaotic within my mind, within my lifestyle. Mm. So the idea of no chaos and just nothingness absolutely scared the shit out of me. So it wasn't until I got my first human skull and I held it and I was face to face with my own mortality, but quite literally, it did something to me. Like it just changed me. It gave me this sense of comfort and it gave me this knowledge that I didn't have. And it's an unspoken knowledge. It's not something that I can just talk to you. And there's something that I offer to all my friends that I'm around. I bring a human skull with me everywhere I go. I fly with it from uh, New York to LA. I literally have three. Is I brought that legal? Three with me. It is, totally. Let's put it this way. It's not illegal. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Let me play devil's advocate for a second. Yes. I understand the therapeutic value in facing your mortality, looking at holding in your hands one human skull. Why do you need 100? Great question. Um, why? Because I am absolutely fascinated by, it's not just a hundred random skulls, right? So I study different cultures. I also study like medical history and, and human pathology and human osteology and development and how we, I, I, it goes further than just human skulls. I have human brains. I have all of it. I'm, I am a procurer of human osteology and history. Okay. And why do I have a hundred? Because I'm crazy. I don't know. Because I, I love skulls. I love them. I think they're beautiful. I think the human skull is beautiful. I like looking at the different shapes. I like looking at the different sizes. I like seeing different diseases and how they inhibit in like the human head or what it does to us. And it has shown me, I guess more of them together just further pushes the main ideology of getting comfortable with death, right? One human skull, sure. A hundred? It feels different. It feels very different. And when you're looking every day, it's in my space, it's in my creative space, it's in my energy. And it has broken down so many constructs that it was built up in my head that are simply not true. Like, I don't believe in ghosts. You don't? I, don't believe in, I do not believe in ghosts at all. I don't believe in, I don't believe in hauntings. I don't believe in any of that stuff. It has brought me so much knowledge that I wait, cannot wait, wait. even- I, I got to stop you. you. You don't believe in ghosts because you haven't experienced it. Not just because I haven't experienced it, but because I just don't think that energy works that way. Oh, brother. Have I got a lot to show you? <laughs> I would love to see it, but I have, I mean, I have been to very dark places. I believe I you. Experienced different, I've, I've sought after this thing as well. I used to be fully into the idea of ghosts and this, like that was all my teenage years. I was so about it and the Ouija boards and this and that. Yes. But when I really, when I really took the, when I really sought the true knowledge, I learned that all that stuff is just like arbitrary things that we create in our mind and projections of our own fears and insecurities that manifest in our brains. Um, I'll respectfully disagree with that. But I do want to tell you, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I was brought up with, um, my mom was from Argentina. So, and she was very, very into like new age and metaphysics. Met why can't I talk today? Metaphysical stuff since the 1950s. And mm -hmm. so past lives and astral travel and all this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so when I was 14, we did like a, a group hypnosis to go into your past lives. And awesome. it was 
really, really cool. And I've done it a bunch of times, but the first time was the only time that it actually worked. And uh-huh. I went back and I saw my past life and it was like, I was just having these intense emotions that I had never felt before as a 14 year old kid when I saw my child in my past life. And I just like wanted to go back and I had died sort of on the younger side and they take you through your death and they have you present at your funeral and then, and the in-between space. And it was, it was really a gift to have this, you can call it belief, but for me, it's a knowledge that our soul goes on, that this is just one life, one experience, one story, and it's done in the you know blink of an eye. So I 150 million percent believe that. I agree with you there. I totally believe that. I totally believe that our souls and energy is reincarnated. You live many times. I know I've lived before. I can feel it. I feel yeah. a sense. I have felt a sense of familiarity with life since I was a kid. I would say crazy shit to my parents as a kid that they'd be like, where the f- did he learn that? Or like, how did he, how does he know that? You know, so I have always felt a sense of familiarity here. And I just know that I've been here before. And, you know, I'm here again to do something. I have some sort of purpose. I have some unlearned lesson. I have something here that needs to be fulfilled that whatever energy or reciprocation I brought back to this takes to learn or, or do. I believe that. But what I guess I should have been more clear with what I said. I don't believe that ghosts can be manifested in things or or remnants like human remains. I really do believe mm. human remains are just left behind vessels. They they are detached. There's no longer energy that is present because if the energy was present, it would not be a human remain. Like the right. simple the simple fact that something becomes a remain is because the energy has left. So, I don't believe in like hauntings in the traditional sense of like ghosts and and that they're embodiments of people. I don't believe that. I believe that energy and energy exchange is very real. I believe in energy. I believe in energy exchange. I guess the spirit is maybe a more like religious idea or religious um, ideology, but I do 150 million, million gazillion percent believe that there's energy exchange, that there's reincarnation within energy. I believe that maybe in a past life, I was not only an animal, but also a plant. There's mm-hmm. different ways the, everything around us is a vessel of experience if something can hold energy i believe that our energy can be displaced there you know can experience things in the eyes of an animal can experience things in the eyes of plants can experience things in the eyes of humans but yeah i don't believe that anybody is going to haunt me i don't believe there's no negative energy even though i have some artifacts that are maybe darker or i have skulls that were that once belonged to like cannibals or cannibal tribes Um, and a part of what I do is also preservation of history. It's not just collecting these things for my, it's not so much collecting it more so than like saving them because Mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff or human osteology or how our medical system even came about was based on the study of human remains. Like we would use real bones. We would use real specimens. We would use all of these things to advance our medical, our, our medicine to where it is today, our scientists to where it is today. And unfortunately, a lot of those things became dated and they were left behind and they were tossed away or they were forgotten about or they were you know mistreated or or somebody died or, or a museum closed down it ended up in the wrong person's hands and then it's you know but these things are a both culturally important to a lot of people and b they're important as medical research because they helped aid us to get to where we are with science and medicine and to just have them discarded or forgotten about i think is not really respectful so i bring them back to life in the sense i mean I bring them back. I refurbish either old specimens or I fix them. And I run my own little curiosity shop, not shop, but like more like a museum type beat where I share certain cultures with people or certain practices with people. And a lot of the things I focus on is like death and breaking the stigma with death and getting our relationship closer to death. Even Armenians, we were like pagans. We were hedonists. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the gas. I think that was the sauce. I think we got to go back there. <laughs> I'm a I'm a big fan of like ancient Armenians. And, you know, we were very earthly people. We were like alchemists. We were alchemists. We were, we were magic people. We worked with the earth. We worked with the sun. We worked with the water. That's very true. And we did an episode on paganism, which up to date, I think the last time I checked on our stats, it's the most listened to episode that we have. Yeah. And I honestly, part of what I want to do is to bring back this Armenian paganism. Now, this might be a hot take. And I don't know if this is something you want to share on your podcast. This is truly Mm -hmm. how I feel. And I might get some hate for it. That's fine. 
But I'm going to tell you, and you can decide whether you think it's appropriate to share or not. But okay, personally, I think that Armenians thrived without Christianity. I think that Christianity served its purpose maybe at a time for Armenian people, but more so has detrimented Armenian people than it has perpetuated our growth ever since we have adopted Christianity and we were so excited to be the first Christians. We were so happy to hold that title. They have only hurt us. 1.5 million of our souls, of our energy was taken from us. They crucified our women and men. They crucified us during the Armenian genocide. Not only did they behead us, torture us, whatever, they crucified us. They made a point to crucify us like they crucified Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that Jesus Christ existed. I believe that Jesus Christ was a philanthropic, philosophical, like just woke ahead of his time, good dude that was manipulated into being what Christianity is today, which I think is so far from what Jesus Christ originally was speaking of. But that's another point. Armenians, I think ever since we grabbed onto that cross, kind of painted a target on our forehead. Um, and it, it, it even goes to right now and the Artsakh war. We were fighting to protect these ideas and we were classified as crusaders. We were schlepped in with crusaders and, and fed this agenda that the that the Islamic nations need to go back and do their ancestral duties of fighting these crusaders. We don't need all of that. Armenians were, weren't even subscribed to that ideology until it was sold to us by, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how deep I want to go into that, but um, <laughs> I just think- um, You're not going to get an argument from me. We don't consider ourselves a Christian family. I just think that the Armenian paganism and the connection with the earth was the true power that we had and this was identified and tried to strip away from us because that's what was our, tr we had like Armenian gods we would worship. There's that's one right. that I've been fixated on that I want to manifest. Like I want to do my own magic and manifest this Armenian God. His name's Vahagan. And mm -hmm. he's like the goddess of like destruction and chaos. And he, and it just kind of like, uh, what's her name? There's a Hindu God. Oh, um, Kali. Yes. Like Kali. We had, it's Vahagan. We had our own Kali and it was an Armenian God. And I'm like, oh my God, that is so cool. Why didn't I know about this? Why was this not taught in my Hayot's Batmuchun? Why was this not taught in my Armenian school? I had so to Paul, go. why do you think that Armenian language doesn't have gender? Why do I think that it doesn't have gender? I don't know, because it doesn't It doesn't have gender. Inca. Yeah, on. you're right. You're right. I don't know, but it's awesome. Oh, Maybe you know why? Because we used to be a matriarchy when we were pagans. That's awesome. We should be a matriarchy again because Lord knows that would do us much better than what we are now. Couldn't be much worse than, <laughs> than yeah, the patriarchy. So, so low-key, I want to do start spreading this message, but I know I'm going to be matched with a lot of people that are maybe not open to hear this kind of message. But like, what really has Christianity done for the Armenian people other than A, paint a target on our heads, right? We constantly fight for being this first, the first Christians. We're protecting that. But like, they just keep murdering us. And well, that, that's not the fault of Christianity, right? Like that's that's maybe a result, but that's not the fault right, of right, Christianity. Right, totally. You're going to get a ton of pushback, but so be it. There is an Armenian pagan revival happening in Armenia and in the diaspora now. It, it very much tries to meld itself, saying that we're not necessarily separate from the Christianity, although you can do both, but we are honoring our ancient Armenian gods and goddesses and traditions and holidays. And, and you know, people go to the Temple of Garni and get married there. There and with a pagan yeah. priest like that's really cool i would it's love so to do cool. that as a yeah. matter of fact I, I would love to do things like that so i i guess what you're saying is right i am trying to revive all this stuff but not by putting christianity down those are just kind of my own you know beliefs and thoughts that have led me there and also i feel like a lot of the christianity has has given like these toxic ideologies that I've seen in maybe my own family, you know, maybe it isn't like that everywhere else, but I can bet that it is. My parents telling me that tattoos are for the devil, piercings are for the devil, this is all for the devil, as you saw that I got it, this, this, that, all this closed-minded stuff. I have friends that are covered in tattoos that are literally nicer and better people than like most people my parents have interacted with. You know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. I had to break these ideologies down time and time again and to prove to them that hey, Whatever you have been programmed to think is not necessarily true. 
And unfortunately, they hold on even the anti-gay sentiment. It's very much, uh, you know, uh, rooted in Christianity. Yeah. In the in the Bible, there is this is bad. So it's against God. And I'm like, all right, dad, we got to break this all down for you, buddy, because you are being bound by this little box. These are the things that I'm trying to break open and kind of like enlighten and not think in these rigid boxed ways. And I'm not saying I'm not trying to like demonize Christianity. But I'm also trying to like derail Armenians from not feeling inclined to only subscribe to that way of thought and maybe taking a step back further and see where our roots originated and what we originally were doing before the changes of time and religion and whatnot. Like what I think came, it's great. Yeah, like what came to us naturally, what our instinct, our, our, our ancestors, our primitive instinct was, and it was connecting to the land. There was this, like you said, getting married in Garni. They actually used to uh, bury people there and they would burn the bodies. Mm -hmm. They would burn the bodies, right? So they would give it to the fire because that's actually a big Hindu thing too, to use fire to like redistribute that energy because fire is such a strong source of energy. So they would burn the body. They would take the ashes and pour some of it in the water and they would throw the rest into the air. And it was a combination of the earth, the wind, the fire, and the spirit being set back into the earth. Very similar to what the Tibetans do, which is I have a couple Tibetan kapalas, which are like Tibetan skulls that they used to consume out of during their rituals. They would drink and eat from the Tibetan monk skull that they would adorn with like these silvers because they believe that they would gain earthly knowledge and wisdom from this vessel while they would meditate. But they would discard of the bodies very similarly to how Armenians would do. But instead of burning the ashes in the fire, they would actually put the body in a place called a burial ground, a sacred burial ground, where birds, certain cassowary birds or like vulture type birds would come and pick away at the body and carry the body into the wind, the air, you know, they would carry them into the horizon, the body parts, and then they would go take the head, clean it, adorn it in silver and use it for ritual practices to like tap into their ex earthly experiences. And it, it all goes back to like the spirit going back into the earth, feeding the birds, going back into the ground, reverting back into the soil, which is something that like Armenians practice too. And I think there's something really powerful and special there because that's the natural way. That is the way. I don't believe in like this, get put in a, this whole funeral burying, all that stuff. The death industry is a scam. And mm -hmm. I know because I study it. I know because I've dived into it. I collect memorabilia from it, old funeral stuff. It's all a scam. You got to pay like $20,000 to die and be put in a fancy box <laughs> that's going to be covered in dirt. Like who made all that up? Yeah, no, it's such a business. Yeah, you got to rent out a block to like put a stone where your parents can come and like visit no. or some shit. Like it's such a scam. And so environmentally unfriendly. It's yeah, bro. Like you don't need to do any of that. Just throw someone in the soil and let it let the earth consume you back to where you once came from. Like, yeah, they have these pods now where you can be a tree. Your <laughs> your body can flourish. Like it can dude, become this. Even tree. that, I'm like, can y'all just stop trying to capitalize on death? Like that's <laughs> it ties. Wait, back wait, in. wait! They can turn you into a diamond. They can turn your ashes into yeah, a diamond. <laughs> it's such a stupid thing, and this is my issue with the West and the ideas of death. This is why I embrace death instead of neglect and push death away because it's just been you. For you feel me? Just like everything else that Western capitalism does. Pohi hamara, pohi gorza. That's it. They just you know, want to suck the last bit of money from you before you're out of the game. You know what I mean? And they Paul, paint it when, in all these. What's up? I was just gonna say, when you're no longer afraid of dying, you're no longer afraid of living. living. You start living, baby, and that is what I want to share. I mean, aside from our Armenianness why I go by dead skull, why I surround myself with death. I like to think that I am on a death current. I surround myself with this energy. And it almost like it has literally made me like life is more homo straight up <laughs> ever since I started doing that. I'm not sitting there and having existential crises. I'm not sitting there and thinking, oh, I should have, I would have. I do what I want. See if the scene choose my own man, because the, the feeling of not is so silly. The, the the feeling of fear, the feeling of judgment or thinking or wondering, what if this happens? What if that happens? I have realized through the knowledge and wisdom that death has given me that it is all, it's all going to be okay. 
and there is nothing to be afraid of. And I just find it so comical that the one truth that we have in life is the one that we fear and run from the most, which is the most asinine, stupid thing a human, be- a human being can do. Like, be afraid of life. Be afraid of the things that life does not prepare you for or the spontaneity of what life can bring you. Don't be afraid of the one thing that when you're born, life is like, look, I can't tell you anything about this game except for the fact that you are going to die at some point. It's true. That's all I can tell you about this game. And then we, we're not afraid of, we become not afraid of the game, but we're afraid of the truth. We're afraid that the game will end. It, it just doesn't make sense. We have it backwards. Like, I do have a million questions that I could ask you, but we will be here for hours and hours. But I want to ask you one more question before we start to wrap it up. And that is, in the spirit of life brings you what it brings you, how important or unimportant is it that your future life partner, I'm assuming you're not married, your future life partner be Armenian? Wow. Uh, Well, here's the thing. In an absolute perfect situation, my life partner would be Armenian just so my parents could shut the hell up. (laughs) Like, just so they could just, so I could give them the one W. They're like, all right, our kid's covered in tattoos, has piercings, it's crazy, it's weird. It's like, let me give them one thing, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it just doesn't work that way. It's not like I neglect the idea of Armenian women. I'm more than happy to create a little purebred, um, <laughs> like, champion bloodline, <laughs> like, all-dominant gene, little hairy little hairy guy. Little you know hairy I mean? Armenian. A little hairy, uh, you little hairy bugger. I'm so down. I am. I could not be more down. But like, Chika, bro, like, Chika, I just do not, I, I have met a lot of Armenian women and men, and I just don't resonate, mm-hmm. I guess. I don't know. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Armenian women, I love them. You know, they're great. It just, I haven't met an Armenian woman that has made me be like, damn, I want to this is my person. I feel connected to this person. Right. And that, that also made me sad growing up that I couldn't ever connect with an Armenian woman like that because it's like, I would, I would love to, but I have connected with other women that are not Armenian. And why would I deny that connection? Like I I have a really beautiful bond with certain non-Armenian women that is like an undeniable, like energetically, like humanistic bond or like, it like feels like kindred spiritual stuff that how could I deny them just because they, you know, they weren't born into my culture. And I've met tons of women that are not Armenian who love my culture, who love Armenian, who want to raise Armenian children, who oftentimes, who oftentimes are more a fan of being and doing Armenian things than some Armenian women that I've met that are, are like desensitized to Armenianism. Yeah, that, you know, that's it's true. Like, it, They've gotten used to it. They're comfortable in being Armenian, so they feel like they don't need to perform Armenian things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they're so comfortable in being Armenian, whereas partners that I've had that are non-Armenian like to perform Armenian things that oftentimes, you know, even I maybe sometimes wouldn't do because I'm like, no, I'm too high am, bro. Like, yes. No, my my American husband is the reason we celebrate Armenian Christmas because he thinks it's cool and he wants me to make Armenian dishes for Armenian Christmas. <laughs> And that's amazing. And like, that's what it's to be continuing Armenianhood. Doesn't necessarily mean you got to marry an Armenian to continue Armenianhood. Lord knows that our ancestors didn't have that privilege when they had to escape and move to other countries. How many Khar Armenians do you think there are out there? Tons of them. Tons. We were displaced. You don't think some of those people married other Otaraz? Because like, you're tripping if you think that. So Armenianness, continuing Armenianness is not necessarily biological. You don't have to marry an Armenian to continue Armenianness. Armenianness is within. And you could tap into that and recreate that and continue that if you so choose to. And you don't have to be with an Armenian to continue that Armenianness. You don't have to be with an Armenian to create an Armenian. And that's that's another stigma that I hope is broken. And even this one girl, you know, that I've been dating for a while now, she um like she the other day, bro, like Gili Gia is one of my favorite songs. You play that anywhere, I will start sobbing. I don't know what it is that like that that song was like melded into like my cry strings. But anybody that can do, and she just like learned it and played it on the piano and sang it for me out of nowhere. And I literally lost my mind. And she's not Armenian. She's Hawaiian. She's indigenous Hawaiian. And she knows what it's like to have your culture stripped away. She knows what it's like to have your culture colonized and pushed to the side. So it's like, we can relate on both areas where like the Hawaiian people have dealt with that just like the Armenian people have dealt with that. And culturally, there's a lot of similarities that we understand. So it's like, 
okay, you're not Armenian, but like you love the idea of Armenianness, and to to put the cherry on top, I think that's Armenian enough. Oh, you feel oh me? that was just a beautiful little bow me? that you tied that you with. <laughs> Did you like that? I, feel I like loved it. Arme- the willingness to be Armenian is Armenian enough. So, as, as they say in Armenian, says Mitcha Gustatsvid, um, <laughs> we could probably talk forever and you are cordially invited to come on anytime and talk about whatever you want. Clearly, one episode is not so enough much. to contain you. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like I could have like, I know you're like, what? You could have talked more about certain things, but like, I, I really could have gone more. I like the shocking ideas of like the skulls and death. And I kind of just do that as like, a way to shock people, but to then teach them. You feel me? Like, it's like, Mm -hmm. I go over the top with having 100 skulls so that you could pique your interest to learn why. And then I can give you this gift of knowledge and message that I'm trying to spread with it. I love it. I think our people need you. I, Hey, that, that means a lot. And I hope that I can continue doing that and muster the confidence within myself and my, even my own family to continue being who I am with no reservation in hopes that it helps young Armenians, old Armenians, any Armenians. Yeah, you're leading by example. I hope so. I hope that I actually, you know, do some good for my people. Mm. We always wrap things up with five fun questions. If you've got a couple more minutes, I'll I ask them to you. I got all the time in the world. Let's go. <laughs> uh, so first question is, what is your favorite Armenian food? Wow, that's tough. I know that stumps everyone. Uh, my favorite Armenian food... Definitely something like my thought they makes. But is is I don't know, like Horvats is such a boring answer. That's if it's your like, favorite, it's your favorite. But like Horvats just hits, you know what I mean? But I will say my favorite Armenian thing I'd say to eat if it's accessible is like Ganachov like hots, you know, when they put like the greenery in the, the bread. The jindalo huts, yeah. Yeah, and then they put like this sweet salted butter situation, condensed milk, I don't know, <laughs> and then like raw onions. That, dude, that like is like a soul orgasm. When I had that in Armenia, I like lost my mind. With like tarhun in there. I don't know, that concoction of herbs in lavash blows my mind. So I don't know, that's not really an Armenian dish. No, it's like, a great answer. It's such a simple, earthly Armenian delight that I'm like, hmm. Look at this treasure. You know what I mean? The second question I already know because we talked about it. It's do you understand both Western and Eastern Armenian? And we're a strong yes on that one. Yeah, super yes. Super (laughs) yes on that. I'll skip it and go to the third question. What is the most American thing about you? Well, how do we define being American? Up to you. Mm, That I'm a consumer? I don't know. (laughs) That I consume content or I consume things like that's pretty American of me. Or uh, maybe like my, mm, maybe like my entitledness to like be who I am is very American. I don't think that that's Armenian. I am confident, not, (laughs) Lord knows if it was just Armenian, I would not be this confident. Um, I could give it to being American to like that, that almost like ignorance, that ignorant like privilege that comes from being American helps helps me be like i don't give it i don't give a shit like i'll do what i want this is america you know what i mean that's a very astute observation yeah that that privileged mentality although is pretty toxic when it comes to like the rest of the world has definitely helped me step up to the courage that i need to address i guess my own culture let's put it that way do you have a favorite armenian celebrity um do i have a favorite armenian celebrity yes i have two can i say both yeah one is Charles Aznavour, and one is Dr. Jack Kevorkian. Oh, wow. I know you could talk about that for a long time. I got to meet Dr. Jack Kevorkian before he died, and I was a young kid, and I shook his hand, and I looked in his eyes, and I'm like, I feel like I'm a reincarnation of this dude, too. I connect so much with everything he talks about, with the idea of death and death escaping the eyes and all of that stuff, and how he was so confident about his thoughts and feelings that he was willing to go to prison to prove a point. I orgasm at the thought of someone being that confident in their thoughts and beliefs that they're willing to risk their life to make a change. So I am indebted to the likes of Dr. Jack Kevorkian and also indebted to Charles Aznavour because I feel like he did something really great for Armenians. And I feel like he was a voice for a lot of Armenian struggle and a lot of Armenian pain. Those two hold a very special place in my heart. I actually have a tattoo for Bohem. That song by Charles Nazavur, I actually have a tattoo of that on the inside of my leg because it's like 
Uh, it's one of those things. It's like Gili Gyal. Like when I hear that song, I don't know what the f he's saying at the time, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the way like Jigyaro Khosuma, like it just, it taps in, it hits. Lastly, and to me always most importantly, well, I say that in tongue in cheek. Do you know how to read Armenian coffee cups? I do. I do. <gasps> um, I, I mean, I don't. I don't because no. it's... No. Back I, to I the first I answer. <laughs> I do and I don't in the sense that I have read Armenian cups and it's helped people. Did I know what I was doing in the sense that I know what I'm doing? No. I just kind of like went off of instinct and my brain just made correlations with certain things that I saw and I perpetuated mm -hmm. that message. It falls into a greater topic that Lord knows I could talk about forever, but tarot, spiritual guidance, this, that, coffee cups. What I really think all of those things are rooted in is somebody who is really good at maybe manipulating someone's thoughts or understanding someone's pain, being an empath mm. and being able to communicate to someone to help them. I also think there are people out there who use that in a bad way, in a negative way, and like can, can take advantage of people's energy and perpetuate. That's true. But I think it takes a special person to do it. And I think all that it takes is somebody who is really, really sensitive, empathetic, and understanding with energy, and then knowing how to communicate that energy to the person who is receiving the message. So have I done it? Yes. Has it helped people? Yes. Do I think that I am some... I have this special gift of reading like Rorschach coffee stains. No, <laughs> uh, more so than I can feel people's pain or hurt and know how to maybe empower them or tell them the things that I think they need to hear to maybe progress forward. So I always looked at it more as like a, a crystal ball that it was just something to focus on. There's nothing in the crystal ball itself. It's totally. just a focal point for you to connect. Totally, totally. And it's something that brings to the allure. It taps you in. Just like how I said the Tibetan monks would drink out of the human skull. Obviously, they're not gaining any wisdom and knowledge from just drinking out of a calcium vessel. But it's the idea. It's the thing that taps you in, the focal point, the idea of doing it, which kind of is like the, the vessel to promote that thought or that energy or that whatever. It's more, you get what I'm saying? Like, yes. it's not like these things actually carry some magical powers, more so what they are, how they are used. And the idea of like, oh, this coffee cup, this lady, she reads it. You come into the room with like a, with like a different, I don't know. A reverence. Yeah. Like it's set up in a way that allows you to receive a message. That, I love that, it. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's what I think. Hey, will you drink a cup of Armenian coffee and turn it over and take a few, snap a few photos of the inside for our Instagram? Of course I will. Of course, of course, of course. I love that. That's so cool that you do that. I'm, I'm a big fan. I know I've been like super hard to get a hold of just because just I'm a maniac, but like I am a huge <laughs> fan of what you're doing. I'm a huge fan of your, your platform and I think it's super important and just wanted to give you um, some of that credit and appreciation. Thank you for being patient and also thank you for, yeah, doing what you do and voicing these voices out and, and creating a home for people to come discover all these lovely things. I know it's a lot of time. I know it's a lot of effort. Just please keep doing it. Don't stop. I think we it's need- It's a labor of love. I do it. it. Um, I, I don't make a penny. It costs me hours and hours and hours of my life. I, I can't even really cover my own costs, but I do yep. it because I think it's needed in the community and because- I really care about what happens to the Armenian community and the Armenian diaspora because I want my kid to grow up into an accepting, beautiful, yep. safe space. And yep. so it matters to me. But thank you so much. I appreciate this. I loved our conversation. Like I said, you're welcome back anytime. Talk about anything you want. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to do that. I would love a part too. And I'm actually like, I'm about to tattoo a bunch of old ancient Armenian symbols all over my head and really go like overdrive. Oh, wow. Things. Yeah, I'm about You're to gonna be, shave your head? Yeah, I'm gonna shave my head. And I think I wanna do like the eternal symbol just really on the top of my head so it can connect with whatever God or creator is looking down can see that eternal symbol at the top of my head. I love it. My my mom built a house in Glendale like decades and decades ago, modeled on ancient Urartu castles. And wow. in our in our driveway, she had the eternity symbol in different colors of brick. Wow. Can I live there? That's so cool. 
Yeah, I don't. It's we unfortunately had to sell it after she passed away, and the oh. the folks who lived there gutted it. But she had Armenian kings and queens, like ancient oh. kings and queens, on the. It was it was amazing. So I'll send you. Cool. <laughs> I'll send and, you a link to her house. Yeah, please do. And in our next conversation, I would love to tap like tap onto like I have stories of going to like Turkey. I had I was forced to go to Turkey for like a school program, or else I would fail the course. It was oh like a God. religion program and I was forced to go there and I was so bitter about it. And it was around the genocide, hundred year. It was around the hundred year mark of the genocide. And they forced oh me, even though I wrote them a letter, I wrote the Dean. I'm like, yo, what you're doing is fucked up. And like, if something happens to me, it's directly your fault. And I'm going to sue the hell out of y'all because like, I am, this is like trauma. You're exposing me to trauma. I was like a sourpuss the whole time. I was just there like trying to fight. I was literally just trying to fight. But that's hard. Yeah, like anybody would be like, oh, you're American? I'm like, no, Armenian. And I would just look at them in their eyes and they would like, yeah, like I was I was problematic for sure, but like I was like ready for it. But then I was Oof. like, you know what, Paul, you're here. And instead of being like, you're here, bro, like make the best of being here so you don't have to come back here ever again. And I went and I found an Armenian church and I had this experience with an Armenian priest that I would like to tell you about one time that really changed my life. And it was the oldest Armenian church in Istanbul. And I went and spent a day with him and he brought me to his home and cooked me food. And I held a piece of like Krikor Lusavorich's cross, like crazy, crazy shit, dude, like straight up crazy shit. And then when I went to Italy, I was in Venice, Italy. I went to the Armenian Degli Armeni. It's like we have like a monastery there. And I accidentally stumbled upon finding out about it. And I went there and I saw like Armenian monks. And I befriended one of the Armenian dudes that worked in the monastery. And he showed me all this stuff there, all these old manuscripts, all these old Urartu like swords and shields. Wow. And it was absolutely mind blowing. And I would love to talk about that maybe on another podcast, okay. because I don't think a lot of Armenians know about that Venetian Armenian. Um, the monastery. The monastery. Not many people know about it. And it literally has so much, so much Armenian history there. And it's so crazy that, like, I think every Armenian in the world needs to go get some. I think you need your own show, but you're definitely welcome to come back onto ours. (laughs) Thank you so, so much for talking to us today. I truly appreciate it. I mean, sometimes there there are interviews that I really have to pull from people, and I I didn't get through half of my questions. I told you I rambled, so I'm sorry. I'm so no, sorry. it was so interesting. Thank you. Um, if you you are in LA, right? Yeah. Well, if you want to get like a coffee or a something while I'm here, yeah, I don't know, just to chat and shoot shoot the shit. It would be cool to meet you, um, even your husband, because you know I would love to hear all these stories about goth goth <laughs> culture in the '90s. Um, yes, that, you know? that he can definitely talk about that. <laughs> You can reach Paul on Instagram at Dead Skull, and he has a couple more links that I will include for the show notes in this episode. A wonderful way to show us that you value the types of conversations we bring you is by supporting us through becoming a patron of Armenian Enough. There are always free ways to show your support for this podcast. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and please continue to share your favorite episodes with those you love. And Anna will kill me if I don't say this. So check out our Instagram to find out about our monthly virtual Zoom meetups where you can get to know fellow listeners. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, remember that you are always more than enough.